talked about this a couple of times in in our movement through the book of Revelation, but I want to talk about it once more. I think it'll be the the last time, but uh, if you've been around, forgive me if you uh, if you haven't. Well, uh, there was this movie. Uh, a Thief in the Night that apparently scarred a lot of people, uh, people older than me, but in my generation. I remember watching this movie as a kid and um, so vividly remember watching this movie as a kid and just being so scared. And so much of it is centered on the book of Revelation. Uh, for those of you that have been with us, like a futurist view of the book of Revelation, uh, specifically a dispensational view of the book of Revelation. And, and it's centered on this. And I was so, it like was so scary. And, and I think that this movie, in some ways, and this was not the intent of the movie, the, the intent of the movie was to, to call people to consider Jesus. And I'm sure that the intent was very good. But, but this movie and, and sermons like it and the culture kind of around the book of Revelation, I think one of the negative things that it's done for the American church is that it has caused us to really fear the things that happen at the end of, of history, right? At the end, like the very, very end. And we've seen throughout our study through the book these glimmers that even if it's the end, or even if it's the end of life as we know it, uh, then for Christians, fear is not the response that we should have. Uh, instead, the response should be one of, of joy and hope and encouragement and all of those types of things. And today in our passage, I think we see this contrast really clearly between you know, those who should fear the end and, and those who should not, us Christians. Uh, and we'll see it in how uh, people respond or are called to respond to the fall of Babylon or the fall of Rome. This is the same subject we've been talking about for several weeks. Now, uh, just, to, just to let you know, uh, next week we'll take one week break from the book of Revelation. And then uh, after that, we have one more sermon kind of centered on this subject. And then we have a Palm Sunday sermon, an Easter sermon. And then uh, for all of you who are like, I want a happy sermon, uh, then we're going to spend our remainder, the remainder of our time in the book of Revelation uh, talking about what eternity looks like for those of us who are Christians. I'm looking forward to that a lot because that's how the book of Revelation uh, ends. And, and today in our passage, we, we have uh, these themes that we've seen a lot of, like God's might, Babylon's destruction, we should be different as Christians. If you've been around even one week, then you've heard some of these themes come up. And, and so we see these themes again, but through it all, and as it all kind of comes together, there's this other thing, and it's this thing about how we will respond when God, how we should respond when God levels the punishment on nations and kings and kingdoms that oppress his people and oppose him. And here's kind of the big call of the day. We should live in such a way that we rejoice over the fall of Babylon rather than fear the fall of Babylon. We should rejoice or we should live in such a way that, that even if we face the end, we can continue to rejoice instead of fearing what that might mean for us, and that will make more sense as, as we go into this passage. Before we get to the passage, I want you to know that there's hints of uh, Ezekiel 27 and 28 in this, and so it would be good homework, and I know at least one person in our church, because we've talked about it, is doing the little homework assignments that I give them. It would be interesting for you, if nothing else, to go read Ezekiel 27 and 28 and to compare it to what we read here in the second half of Revelation 18. That would be, I think, an enlightening study for you, because the better you know the Old Testament, the more easily you'll understand the book of Revelation. And I would even say as an extension of that, the better you'll understand the New Testament as a whole. But uh, in Ezekiel 27, 15 of the 29 commodities that we'll talk about here, like actual traded commodities, like real commodities, they're, they're listed there. Uh, you see the same three groups that are mentioned in our passage in Ezekiel 27, uh, the kings, the merchants, and the maritime people. Uh, who delivered goods to Rome. Uh, and so, so I want, go read it. It'll be interesting to you. If, you. if you have some free time, read Ezekiel 27, 28. Look at that. But today what we see is these three groups that are alluded to in the Old Testament and now here. Uh, we see them mourning, mourning the fall of Babylon 
And then we see this call kind of come out of nowhere to Christians, especially Christians who are, are experiencing eternity, to rejoice over the fall of Babylon. And that's what we're going to kind of look at today. There's a tension there. And it's important for us to understand. So here's what Revelation 18, 9 and 10 says. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her, that's Babylon, and shared her luxury, see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. Now they see the smoke of, of Rome burning and oftentimes smoke and fire are connected to God's punishment or the collapse of a world order in the Bible. This is language that is used around that and here it's, it's talking about the fall of Babylon or the fall of Rome and it's meant to, to demonstrate to us the finality of this and we talked about that some last week. I mean, there, the author is inspired by the Holy Spirit and John given this vision it really is important to this book that you remember that Babylon is going to fall and that fall is going to be final. I mean, it just carries on and on and on. It also reminds us of like the thing that happens at the end of the world. Listen to 2 Peter 3, 12. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. And so this fall of Babylon no matter what viewpoint you take on the book of Revelation, whether you see it as something happened in the future, something in the past, something that has no historical significance or something that's a timeline through human history, no matter what view you take, the demonstration of Rome's fall here, you just can't help but be reminded of what will take place someday when Jesus returns. Like it just, the language is too similar. And so here what we read is they see the smoke and they're weeping, the kings of the earth. These are not the same kings as the ones who are trying to obtain power. These are kings who, who are mourning because, not because they love Babylon, not because they're on the side of Babylon or Rome, but instead because of selfish fear, it seems. It seems that they are worried because of selfish fear. They understand what this nation can do for them, what it has done for them. And now they look and they say, wow, this world power has fallen so quickly. And so they're like selfishly like, oh, that's bad for us. But also, I think if I could read into the text just a little bit, that they're scared because if it could happen to this kingdom, then it can surely happen to us as well. These groups we encounter here, they don't mourn because of the loss of life. They don't mourn because of the fall of an empire. They mourn because of what they lose in this, whether that's security or, or wealth or their jobs. They mourn for selfish reason. And in this morning, we see this, this same thing duplicated three times. First, they are terrified and then it says they stand far off, and then they cry out, woe, woe, and then they say something after those woes, and those woes are specific about Rome. And I think this is instructive for us as people. Like, either we are, we are people who just use the things in our society and culture, and we love it because of what we gain from it, or, or we love it in a selfish way. And, and I would say that what should separate Christians in some ways from the people around us, I think one of the things that will determine whether or not we, we fear the end or we are excited about what the end looks like, whether that's the end of life as we know it or the end of it all, like one of the things that will separate us is whether or not we love, we love our city and our country because of what we gain from it or if we love our city and country like Jesus loves the people in our cities and countries. And you see the groups here, the kings and the merchants and the people of the sea who make money off of Rome, like, oh, they loved, they loved Rome because of what Rome could do for them. And as Christians, I mean, here's, you know, we, you know this, like we, we believe that Jesus came from heaven to earth and he loved us not because of what we could do for him, but because of his character and nature his grace and mercy was poured out upon us and if we're following Jesus then then we don't love the world in a selfish like oh I can gain so much you know I can have and build prosperity and all those things we love the world because because Jesus first loved us 
And these groups love selfishly. They love the security. They love the power. They love what they gain. And they stand far away and they just cry out, woe, 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 woe. Now notice here that Rome falls in one hour and it's like, this mighty, I mean, the kings point out to the might, mighty Rome. And what did we talk about last week? If you were here, you know, the mightiness of God is, is so far and away above the kings and kingdoms and cultures and cities of, of the world that, that like it's not even a thing. They have no might and power unless it is given to them by God. There is no real power. God is in control of it all. He is sovereign. He is the sovereign Lord. And here these kings look on and they're like, this this thing that was indestructible has fallen apart in no time at all. I'll say that I, I hate to keep doing it, but if you think about our country, I mean, we have, you know, maybe not as much today, but if you go back 20 years, you're like, there is no nation, there is no thing that could touch us. Like, we are indestructible, Right? I think that's instructive for us here because Rome was that in its day, right? Like Rome, no, nobody was going to beat it in a war. Like, you know, nothing. I mean, it was financially the, the richest nation in the history. Like nothing could touch it. There's no way this kind of kingdom falls. And then as we'll see over and over and over again in one hour, done. Our nation Every nation, there is no real security. There is no real power. And if you find your hope in, you know, living in a country that has it all, has the greatest military and is, you know, financially very good, then, then you live, you're living a lie because there's actually no security in that at all. And this passage tells us that. We'll come back to that hour idea, but let me read uh, the next handful of verses, verses 11 through 17. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, Horses and carriages and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit you longed for has gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin." The merchants aren't weeping because of love for this nation. They're weeping because they've lost their source of income. No one buys their cargoes anymore. I mean, this is the greatest importer of goods on earth, right? They're importing so much that they're making other nations and the merchants, they're making them wealthy. The merchants will be, you know, reintroduced later in the passage and, and it says they gained wealth from Rome, the prostitute or Babylon, Rome, it made everyone around it wealthier. And so they loved it. Jim McGuigan says, with whom to commit fornication with a promise of prosperity. They didn't in, just engaged in the sins of Rome. Why? Because it made them wealthy. It made them wealthy. Listen to this. Robert Mounts wrote a, a great commentary on this. Uh, book on the book of Revelation, he, he reminds us of these incredible, lavish things that Romans did. At one of Nero's banquets, the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian roses alone cost nearly $100,000. Another guy had a penchant for delicacies like peacock brains and nightingale's tongues. Uh, and this guy in his reign spent over $20 million, our money, on food. One Roman, after squandering an immense fortune, committed suicide because he could not live on pittance and remained, that remained of about $300,000. He, he couldn't live on $300,000 annually, so that was it for him. 
The people ate and bathed on silver and silver and the wealthy had ivory plates and, and there was 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Uh, and all of these things are connected or the last three things I said anyway to the cargo that these merchants are selling. They are getting rich and now they look out and they, they see that it's all collapsed. It's collapsed right in front of them. Yeah, they, they had people and slaves as cargo, and we know that that's atrocious, right? But remember, they literally were putting some of these people into the amphitheater to fight unto death. There were slaves who they enslaved just to fight to death so that they could be entertained by it. Saw this cargo described, all of that, and, and then you notice again, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The fall of Babylon is final and these people are seeing it and they're mourning it because it means that their wealth and their source of wealth has gone away. And I want you to notice that the kings, they point more to the security of, that Rome offered them. And these merchants, they point to the allure or the attractiveness of the country that, or the nation, the kingdom that they're looking at. And so we see these two sides, two things that again, we, we can see in America. I mean, we love our security here and we also love the, the luxury here and you know, all the things that we can do. We're an entertainment driven society. There's a book out there called Entertaining Ourselves to Death. It's never been more true than it is right now in the United States of America. And these merchants, they stand far off they're terrified and they weep and they cry out, woe, woe. They are sad because the attractiveness of Rome, it just doesn't seem like it can fall, but it does and it falls in an hour. Symbolically, notice the language here. It's wearing fine fabric royal, which is a royal color and it's glittering with gold and precious jewels. Rome was not ugly on the surface. The underbelly of Rome was ugly, but the, uh, the outside of Rome, was gorgeous. It was attractive to people. People were drawn to all the glitz and the glamour of this great kingdom. But it didn't matter because it fell. I want to remind you here, don't, do not let the beauty of the world draw you in and pull you away from God. Because that's, that's in nations like ours, like this is an easy passage to preach and as a modern American, right? Because it's, it's hard not to see the parallels. We are not, I do not believe, you know, Babylon in a strict sense, but we have so many of the characteristics of Babylon that we read about in the book of Revelation. Like for me to not extend and go look around, would, I wouldn't be very good at preaching this passage because it's easy to see. And one of the things that we have most in common is that we we live in a culture where, where it just allures us and it pulls us and it pulls us away from God because we're like, I want that too. I want that too. But all of its beauty had no staying power because in one hour, one hour, it says, it all just went away. Now, I want to return to that term because hour in John's writings is not literal. He uses the term hour a lot. I, I've talked about that earlier in the book of Revelation. I, I talked about that, I think, more extensively when I preached through the book of John uh, about a year ago now. Um, but it's important. You could do a whole word study if you want another piece of homework. Just read the book of John or all of the, the Johannine books in the Bible and just look for the word hour. But really what you see is that it's a term of action and activity and it's meant to represent a short time in our passage. We've already seen a half hour described. And, and so really what we're seeing here is that all the beauty and all the security, all the military might, all the power, none of it could stand very long as soon as God decided to take action. Just couldn't stand. By the way, this is fascinating. Nero, one of the great persecutors of the church, one of the top two maybe in history persecutors of the church, he set fire to Rome for one week and couldn't destroy it. And here, God is set, said to just destroy it in one hour. What, what's, what's the message there? Like, what's the message Nero, with all your power, you know, ruler of the greatest kingdom on earth, you're nothing compared to the God that we serve. 
Revelation 18, 17 through 19 says, Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. These are captains and travelers and people who make their money on the sea. Um, it's not something we're as familiar with today, I don't think. But, but think about, just I would just say this, think about all the people who transport the goods that we, that we have, you know, whether that's uh, via railroad or whether that's through um, trucking or whether that's cargo on the sea, like all of those people, that's what's being described here. All who have their jobs because of the wealth of this great kingdom and this city specifically, all of those people are crying out, whoa, whoa. They are standing far off. They are, it doesn't say they're terrified, but they mourn and they weep and they cry out, whoa, whoa. Was there ever a city like this great city? Ezekiel 27, 32 says something similar. As they wail and mourn over you, they will take up a lament concerning you. Whoever silenced Tyre, surrounded by the sea. You see that there's this theme. Look, we're talking about Rome here, most likely, specifically. But this has been a theme throughout human history. Nations rise up. They are powerful. It seems like nothing could ever happen to them. They become nations that that oppress God's people and oppose him. They seem to, to, as they grow and they gain wealth, it seems like more and more they pull people away from God and they stand as opposed to God and what he is about. The morality of nations seems to dwindle. It gets worse and worse and worse as they become more powerful and more wealthy and more attractive to the nations around them and then they end they end it's been happening throughout human history and boy oh boy i think there's a great warning for us here in this country like this is our this is a description of us in many ways it's not us that's not what the author first and and the readers first foremost had in mind but the application seems so clear to me Like look around you and we see the same thing happening in our country. We become so mighty, we become so attractive and we become so wealthy. And if God wants to, in one hour, he can do away with it all, if he wants to. Now notice this group, they focus on just one more thing. It's like we have the power, we have the beauty and now we have the money, right? It's too powerful, it's too beautiful, it's too wealthy. There's no way this thing can crumble. But in one hour, God tears it all down. It just ends for them in no time at all. Now I'll point out that each group sees the fall in terms of its own interest. That's Robert Mounts again. But they all see it in terms of their own interest. And I would just wonder if we fear the collapse of our nation, our great nation, If we fear that, what part of that are we too connected to? Are we finding our security, you know, in this country? Is that it? Is it just that we think, hey, I live in a nation that protects me? Are are we finding, you know, are we just caught up in the allure, all of the entertainment and all the lights and all the glitter and the comforts of our society too much? And that's what we fear losing if our nation was to collapse? Or is it our money, right? Is it just the wealth that, that we look at our country and we think this is what supplies my needs and this is where, you know, I, I, I may, this is why because of the wealth of our nation, this is why I'm able to do and buy the things that I do and buy and all that stuff. Like I would just ask what for you, for you, for me, which one of those three things are we just a little too tied to our country in? Because the God that I serve, right? Like as you read scripture, like, He's the one that provides for us. And, and when we get it out of whack and we look at our country and we think, well, you're, you give me my happiness, you give me my success, you take care of my needs, that's wrong. It's God who gives us our joy and our peace and our security and provides for our needs. That's what the scriptures tell us. And so I ask you, like, which one of those things maybe are you just a little too tied to our country about? If America falls, are you going to go, oh, no, there goes my entertainment? You know, or if America falls, are you going to go, well, there goes my security? If America falls, are you going to go, well, there goes my, my source of life? Because here's, the, here's 
Our country, no country, is that. Like, it's God. Like, you need to find your satisfaction, your joy, and your hope, and your security in God because nations rise and fall, as we sang earlier, but there is someone who is standing still, and that is the God that we serve. He's gone nowhere. Now, I know, if I would have said this, man, if I would have said this 15, 20 years ago, like, I think people would have been like, yeah, we're fine. You know, America's fine. But doesn't it feel so real today? I mean, what we just lived through, you know, in 2020 and 2021, and all of a sudden everything that we knew, it just was just gone from us. We couldn't do the things. We couldn't uh, go the places. Like, it was all gone from us. And, and as we sit here today, I mean, good night. I got uh, a call from Annette, who's in our church. She's a banker, and, and she's dealing with some of the fallout of this bank down in uh, uh, Silicon Valley and... and <laughs> The last time Annette called me, she called me 30 minutes before the world shut down for COVID. So when she called me last night to say, hey, can you pray for me? I'm dealing with this banking thing. I'm like, well, there goes everything. You know, like last time we had this talk, Annette, it didn't end so well. Um, and so I'm going to go, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to sit here and uh, and consider my last 30 good minutes for the next two years. Um, but But I mean, I think more than ever, we see that our nation isn't the solid rock that we thought it was or that we felt like it was, you know, 10, 15, 20, 40, 50 years ago. You know, Jesus has this parable, right? You probably know it. And it's the parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And in it, he talks about this foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And when the rains and the floods come, the house crashes down and that's a parable for a life built on anything other than God. And then he talks about this other life or house that's built upon the rock. And he is the rock. And, and he builds it in the, the floods and all the stuff comes, the wind. And, and the house comes, or the house stands firm, stands firm. Thank you, didn't do this. It stands firm. The house stands firm. We have a tendency to build our lives on the things that our country offers and I think God is reminding us here that, that we need to build our lives on him and not the beauty, the security, the wealth that our country affords us in America. Because one is solid and one is not. One can come crashing down in a minute. Now, this last part is fascinating. Um, it's just not what you'd expect. It's, it's almost a part that, my, my gut reaction, I shouldn't tell you this, but my gut reaction is like, I don't like this. Um, but, but I think it's important. Listen, verse 20, rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. So there's this command. It's interesting. A command that says, okay, here's three groups that are mourning because they were so tied to what Rome was doing. They were finding their wealth and their fun and their security in Rome. But now Christians, some people say it's just Christians on the other side of eternity, but it doesn't appear that way to me. It says, hey, Christians, rejoice over the fall of this great kingdom. Now, I want to just as I say that, before we talk about that, I, I want to say that there's this tension, right? And it's important that we maintain this tension um, because I, I don't think we should run around saying, I hope America blows up or whatever, you know, like I, that's not the, like we need to, we need to have this tension and the tension is this, we're called to rejoice here, but at the same time, we must love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and even serve our enemies, right? And so there's this call biblically to love those who oppress us and hurt us and all of those things. And, and so here we see on the, maybe the other side of that, that we are called to rejoice when kingdoms and kings who oppress God's people and oppose his plans and ways and will, when they fall, but at the same time, we can't leave behind Jesus' commands to love and pray for and serve those who oppress us. And so, again, there's a tension here, and I think an important part of that tension is that we're not rooting against individuals. We're not rejoicing at the fall of individuals here. We're rejoicing at the fall of a system really, a system that is 
that is on Satan's side, that is speaking on behalf of Satan, that is calling people, pulling people towards the worship of Satan and away from the worship of God. And it's doing it not just in small ways, but by literally killing, shedding the blood of the people who are serving Jesus. It's, it's rejoicing over this powerful thing that pulls people away from the worship of God and into the worship of Satan, and it does it through the blood of God's people. Uh, Jim McGuigan again says, her judgment is seen as a real cause for rejoicing. Heaven can't but rejoice at the death of such a monster. Apostles have every reason to. Prophets, Daniel or John, will have reason to smile. Their word has come true and their fellow servants are now having rest from the ungodly harlot. God has judged Rome with the judgment she has imposed on these people, Revelation 18.6 says this, give back to her as she has given, pay her back double for what she has done, pour her a double portion from her own cup. What we're supposed to rejoice about here is the fall of the system and the victory of the church. We still love, pray for, serve those who hurt us and persecute us. We still pray that they'll give their lives to Jesus and they'll become a part of the church. This doesn't nullify all of that. We must hold these tensions together, but we must recognize that a day will come ultimately for us when the system that tries to pull us away from our service of God will be put to end. This, the book of John elsewhere describes the world, right? The world is really negative in the book of John. And, and we see this, this worldly system. It's a system that is opposed to God and hurts his people. Robert Mount says the church victorious is to rejoice that God the righteous judge has turned back the evidence laid against believers and in turn has served to bring judgment upon the accuser himself. We will rejoice because the system that pulls us away from God is done away with. Uh, for the, the people living in first century Rome, that was the fall of Rome that they were looking forward to. But for us, there will come a day when all of this, all of this, the world will be burned up and, and Jesus will take us if we are Christians to be with him. We will live in heaven. He will create a new heaven and a new earth. We will come back and we will dwell in an eternal perfection on, on earth, a recreated earth. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be perfect. Like I'm looking forward to it. And we must remember that we will rejoice about that. And so I started by saying, I think this is so important. By the way, Revelation 18, 21 through 24, it, it describes the finality. Let me just read you some phrases. Never to be found again, never to be heard in you again. No work or whatever will be found in you again. Will never be heard in you again. Will never shine in you again. Never be heard in you again. I mean, you, you kind of get it. Like the fall of Rome is final. It's over. It's done. There's no coming back from what has taken place. And verse 24 says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. And the Bible tells us, really, that there's two choices. We can be the people of Rome, or we can be the people of heaven. And Jesus came from heaven to earth, and he came to die for our sins. He came because we, you know, like Rome, had become enemies of God. We were caught up in the luxury and the security and the wealth of the world, and we sinned, and we made ourselves enemies of the God who created us and gave us life. But Jesus came, he suffered, and he died. He did that in order that we might be forgiven for our sins so that the curse could be broken, so that we could be bought back from our transgressions. And he came back to life after three days and he offers us an opportunity to become his children. And if we are his children, we should live in such a way that we are not tied to the system that stands in opposition to him and oppresses his people so that we could with full conscience say, if it all falls apart, I will still rejoice because I am a citizen of heaven and there is security and there is hope and there is joy in that. And so the call is twofold for us this morning. First, if you're not a Christian, become one. Because this, there is no security here in our country. There is no security in any country. Russia, China, America, all the small ones. There's no security. There is only security through a relationship with God. And so become a Christian. And then, if you have, 
live in such a way that you are not fearful of the end, but you are looking forward to the end because you know at that moment the system that opposes us will be done away with and the church, you and I, will be victorious for eternity. That's what's at the heart of this. It's not saying, I want you to collapse. I want you to die. You know, we're praying for our nation. We are going to keep praying for our nation. We're going to pray for our leaders. We're going to do all that. But we're going to live in such a way that we look forward to. We don't fear. We look forward to the day when Jesus sets everything right. Let me pray that we will. Lord Jesus, there's a culture around the book of Revelation in, in the modern church that is so fearful. And we read of these descriptions and think, wow, that could be us too. That could be America too. And it could be. I mean, you could do away with us in one hour, Lord. But if you choose to do that, you are right in your judgment. We've seen that in the book of Revelation. Even if we don't understand it, even if we don't like it, you are right in your judgments. And God, it means victory for us. Now, God, I thank you that we are not as far along in America, as Rome was, I mean, they were slaughtering your people for not worshiping emperors. And God, I pray that we never get to a point in our country where people are arrested because of their relationship with you, where people are hurt because of their relationship with you, where people are killed because of their relationship with you. I pray we never get there. I pray, in fact, God, for revival in this country, that, that we would see people come to salvation, God, by the thousands and even the millions, God, like people would come into a relationship with you, and our nation, God, would, uh, would be a beacon of, of truth and goodness rather than a beacon of, of sinfulness, um, God, and idolatry but lord for those of us who are christians that live here i pray that we would not take hope and and that our nation might get better or isn't as bad but we would take our hope and find our security in you lord and who you are and that you are god uh, the great provider and that you are the great giver of joy lord and that you are the one who is sovereign and reigns over all god i pray that we would not be connected to too closely connected to the security and the wealth and the allure of our country but but god we and our attention would be always always on you lord jesus because you are so much better i pray these things in your name jesus amen